I've played a lot of games this year. I say that as if I'm not the type of person who's already counted. I have. It's 93. Of those, I've beaten 66 of them, which is easily the most games I've ever beaten in a year. It's been nice. I finally got around to some incredible titles that have been in my backlog for arguably too long. I replayed a few of my old favorites to mixed results. I jumped into a bunch of multiplayer games where I yelled at my friends a lot, and I tried to keep up with the constant stream of new titles as best as I could. I played so many games this year because more than any other time in my life, I've needed to. On the most practical level, now that talking about games is is my job, playing them, or having my wife play them, gives me new things to talk about, and the more experiences I have, the more videos I can make. On a more human level, I've needed them because, and I'm not sure if you knew this, this year has been… bad. On a global scale, there is more fear, unrest, and uncertainty than there ever has been in my lifetime. It's been scary, and these things make the normal stresses of life feel much heavier. On top of that, being safe and playing my part in not making the pandemic worse has involved a lot of isolation, which has given me far less to do in my free time and as I'm the type of person who can easily fall into the trap of staring at a wall for 8 hours spiraling into my anxieties, I've needed video games to keep that from happening too frequently. This year, games helped me cope in all sorts of ways, and I want to talk about a few of them that have stuck with me the most. This isn't really a game of the year video. In fact, a handful of the titles I'm going to talk about came out years ago. Due to the nature of 2020 though, it's impossible for me not to tie my recent experiences with games to the current state of the world. So in a weird way, every title I've played this year, regardless of when it actually released, will always be a 2020 game to me. They're the games that got me through this year, and that's how I'll remember them for better or worse. So let's start at the logical starting point. The first game I played this year, A Short Hike. <laughs> There's a weird sort of magic to a short hike. Despite being a small game, I found it really easy to lose myself within Hawk Peak Provincial Park. The game opens with the playable character deciding to climb to the top of a mountain in order to get cell phone service, a simple and relatable enough objective. As I glided around the island, collecting shells, money, and most importantly, golden feathers that allowed me to climb higher, I almost immediately stopped focusing on my destination and instead got lost in the act of exploring and of talking to the folks on the island and helping them with their various needs. I always remembered that the goal was to get to the top of the mountain, but by the time I got there, I had kind of forgotten why. Which I think is the entire point of the game. It's about taking the time to focus on what's around you instead of worrying so much about what's ahead. Especially at the start of all the quarantine in this year, I found myself drifting towards games like A Short Hike. Calm titles that centered around exploring and building relationships with others. In a time where going outside and talking to people was not an option, video games games were a decent alternative. I, like most people who owned a Nintendo Switch, latched onto Animal Crossing New Horizons when it first came out in March. Honestly, just hearing the sound of wind rustling through the trees and water lapping against the shores made me more emotional than it had any business doing. I explored the far, far range of Slime Rancher, gathering various critters to raise and uncovering the surprisingly moving story of the ranch's former owner. I terrorized a quiet and unsuspecting English village in Untitled Goose Game and didn't feel bad about it for a second. I revisited Pelican Town for the first time in years and remembered why I fell in love with the routine of Stardew Valley in the first place. I built a really, really big tree in Minecraft because that's just what I do, and it gave me the perfect spot to keep an eye on all my friends. I traveled to Snacktooth Island and not only got to know the cast of Bug Snacks, but ended up relating to each of them on a shockingly deep level as I uncovered what caused everything to fall apart. This year, it was impossible for me not to value the beauty of various virtual worlds in a way I never had before, even in games that weren't inherently relaxing. Whether it was the stunning vistas in Ghost of Tsushima, the lush forest of Ori and the Will of the Wisps, or the sprawling island of the Pathless, my appreciation for gorgeous environments hit a new high this year as most of my days were spent stuck looking at the same four walls. To be clear, I didn't entirely replace talking to friends and family or going outside for fresh air with video games, but they did help fill in some of the gaps that came from the restrictions set in place to keep us all safe. In a year that had absolutely no chill, it was nice to retreat into all of these games. They gave me a chance to relax and reflect on what I was doing instead of worrying about things out of my control.
That isn't to say my year was filled solely with more relaxed and reflective experiences. It really wasn't. Especially over the summer, I sought out challenging games. I played Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy for the first time, leading to a dozen or so hours of suffering before finally making my way to the top. I replayed Dark Souls and got destroyed by a few of the bosses who still give me trouble despite having beaten the game a dozen times by now. I even did smaller challenges, like clearing the Path of Pain in Hollow Knight and defeating Sans in Undertale just to prove that I could. Oh, and I started speedrunning Super Mario 64 to bring a new challenge to an old classic. I'm still really bad at it though. Oddly enough, the time frame that I played most of these games was when the stress of the year weighed on me the heaviest. That might sound counterproductive, but I think taking on these dumb little challenges gave me something to feel good about overcoming. The sense of relief I got from clearing that final hurdle in Bennett Foddy and the excitement that washed over me after dodging Sans's last attack are feelings that I will never forget. And in a time where it was so easy to spiral down dark paths, these little victories helped ground me a bit. They gave me something to celebrate when things worth celebrating were hard to find and the feeling of satisfaction I got by the end made every failure feel worth it. And speaking of failures that feel worth it… Hades was pretty much the only thing I did in October. During that month I played it for over 100 hours and got all the achievements. It was a problem, but a really fun problem. I'm far from being the first person to say this, but playing a game centered around trying and failing to escape from hell is, as it turns out, quite relatable right now. To be honest though, while I wish I could spend the next few hundred words talking about how the various themes of Hades changed my outlook on this year and life in general, I can't. That wasn't my relationship with the game. The reason I'm talking about it right now, as simple as it is, is that playing it just felt really good. <laughs> Hades has some of the best pacing I've ever seen in a game. In each room it rewards players with new boons, upgrades, items, or currency, and almost more importantly, it provides interesting and meaningful choices with each of those things, whether it be which option to take or even which path to follow. This made it so the reward was almost always one I was happy to get, because I could choose what best fit my playstyle on any given run. On the larger scale, between each run it always rewards players with some kind of progression, whether that be permanent upgrades, new aesthetics for the House of Hades, or story developments and character growth. It provided me with a constant flow of dopamine, and even when I failed a run, I felt good because the game still rewarded me in some way, and it made me just want to get back into the next run. Beating Hades gave me a similar sense of accomplishment as the challenging games I played over the summer did, but without nearly as much frustration. In a game like that, it was really nice to have in order to help offset some of the stress and existential dread I was feeling this October. I needed something that challenged me enough to give me that strong sense of satisfaction when I succeeded, but also didn't make me wallow in my failures. And that's what Hades did. It made me feel good. And sometimes that's all you need out of a game. With that said, sometimes a game making you feel bad is just as valuable. So let's talk about The Last of Us Part 2. I know that this game didn't work for a lot of people, and I'm not going to try to convince anyone who didn't like it that they actually should have. The Last of Us Part 2 takes a lot of risks, primarily with its narrative and structure, and those risks led to it being a terrible time for some, and an incredibly moving one for others. Especially when it first came out, I saw a lot of arguments about the quality of the game. So many of them seemed based in trying to convince others to view the game in the same way they did. But as I heard more and more takes on Part 2, I realized that no one else's criticisms or even praise would change the experience I had while playing and processing it. The Last of Us Part 2 made me feel a lot of things. Anger, frustration, fear, exhaustion, awe, empathy, happiness, as fleeting as it was, and maybe most of all, grief. It felt personal. More than any game I had played before it, I had a very human connection to its world and characters, and I think a large part of that comes from how dynamic my understanding of both Ellie and Abby ended up being. 
Ellie, a character I loved in the first title, grew into a stranger who as time went on, I found myself repulsed by. But in spite of that, I still held out hope that she'd make her way out of the dark, because I didn't want to give up on the plucky kid I once risked everything to save. And Abby, a character I hated for the first half of the game, became someone I understood. And while I never forgave the harm she caused, I reached a point where I cared about her enough to also want the best for her. I watched both of them grow, for better and for worse. And honestly, in both cases, it was uncomfortable to experience. But that's why I'm still thinking about it six months later. Their lives are messy and painful and human. I feel like I lived actual shit with both of them, instead of just watching a grand adventure they went through. It left me feeling raw. I remember staring at my TV for an hour after finishing, not really knowing what to think, and then spending the next week trying to process everything I had just played. I spent a lot of time considering how certain things made me feel, and while I won't act as if every single aspect of part two is perfect, I walked away with a connection to it that I've never had with a game before, and I was pretty sure I never would again. Then I finally played Red Dead Redemption 2. I've never been as pleasantly surprised by a character than I was with Arthur Morgan. When I started, I remember wishing I could just play as John Marston. He was the character I knew and cared about, and the idea of experiencing the tales from his days with the Vanderland gang sounded like the most interesting path the story could take. When I finished the game, I not only liked Arthur more than John, but I liked him more than any protagonist I've ever played as. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a slow burn, and it's in that slowness that Arthur gets the chance to to stand out. Where a lot of characters are written to establish a connection to the player quickly through charisma and humor, Arthur takes his time and does it through subtleties. This made it take a while for me to connect to him, but eventually his personality seeped into me, and I started finding even the simplest of actions to be endearing. Like the way he responds to others, the way he whispers calmly to his horse, and even the way he lets out certain breaths. <sighs> Of course, there are more consequential aspects of his character that I found compelling. Primarily, the way he changes throughout the game, and how the choices I made as a player changed him as well. In a lot of ways, the story of Arthur Morgan hits different in 2020. The player becomes Arthur right when his way of life has started to crumble out from under him, and he's left to decide how to move forward with what little track remains. The wide world he once freely roamed continuously closes in on him, and all of this forces him to start confronting himself. He grabs he grapples with questions he never had to grapple with before, like what's the value of freedom if it means always being on the run? Or how does one stay loyal when the group they've sworn loyalty to start to form cracks between each other? Or what does it mean to do good after a lifetime of doing bad? These questions don't all have easy answers, but in one way or another, Arthur, and in turn the player, has to address them, and doing so solidified my bond with Arthur in a way no game has done before. When I think about him, he feels like someone I actually knew. And maybe that's weird, but it's just the way it is. I think both Red Dead Redemption 2 and The Last of Us Part 2 meant so much to me this year because they challenged certain patterns of thought that I find myself falling into. It has become frighteningly easy to slip into the doomer mindset, especially in the age of the internet where nuance is in short supply, assuming the worst in situations and people has unfortunately become pretty standard practice. And I think both of these games are reminders of the perils that can come from viewing the world through that lens. They're about how a person can't be defined by their worst or even their best day. How it's possible to learn to live with someone you can never forgive. How simple displays of kindness matter. They're games about humanity, and they've helped remind me to pull back sometimes, and instead of always assuming the worst in the world, to take a gamble that love exists and do a loving act. I know for a lot of people, that's not what either of these games meant to them, but it's what they meant to me, and I will always appreciate them for it. 
Obviously, video games are not the most important thing in the world, but they have been very valuable to me throughout this year. They've given me a place to escape to, they've challenged me when I've needed it most, and they've gotten me to reflect on who I am and what's important in this life. I genuinely think they've made me a better person, and I plan to take the things I've learned from them with me to 2021. I don't know what next year will bring. I hope there's less existential dread hanging over our heads at all time, but I can't guarantee anything. However, even if things aren't better, I think this year has made me a stronger person, and I found better ways to cope with hardships around me. I'm willing to tackle any challenge that comes my way. So, yeah. I don't know what next year will bring, but I sure as fuck will be playing a lot of video games to get through it.